Hi everybody and welcome to Vocabulary TV. In this video lesson, we shall try to understand 10 of the most important figures of speech in English. Since these figures of speech form the very foundation of good writing and conversational skills, a basic understanding of these is extremely crucial for any English learner. Also, questions based on these figures of speech regularly appear in various exams such as the board exams, CAT, SAT, etc. There are two more lessons previously published on our channel which cover figures of speech such as simile, metaphor, etc. 22 of them. So after you complete this lesson, do watch those lessons as well for a comprehensive coverage of this area. The very first figure of speech and one of the most commonly used ones is allusion. Allusion is an expression designed to call something to mind without mentioning it explicitly. It's an indirect or passing reference. For instance, when I say Gandhian principles are as relevant today as they were yesterday, I am making an allusion to Mahatma Gandhi and all that he stood for suddenly springs up in the reader's or listener's mind even though I did not explicitly mention it. It's clear from the sentence that principles such as non-violence, cleanliness, truthfulness, etc. that are timeless are being talked about. Or, when I say that my mathematics professor at college has Einstein's brains, now, Albert Einstein was a very famous physicist of the last century and almost everyone knows him to be one of the brainiest persons that existed on this planet. So, when I make a reference to him in this sentence, I am able to immediately connect and convey my message to the reader or listener. So, we see that allusion is a figure of speech that quickly stimulates different ideas and associations using only a couple of words. There is only one condition for an allusion like this to work as you intended. And that condition is, you have to play upon a reference that is common knowledge and more importantly, is known to your audience. There could be thousands of examples for allusions. Some of them derive from famous persons, some others from mythological or classic stories. For example, take the word Nike. The brand Nike is an allusion to the winged goddess of victory who can run and fly at great speeds. So when the famous sports good company Nike named itself so, the message it probably wanted to convey was that if you use our shoes, you would be able to run at great speeds. Another mythological allusion that I can take as an example is that of the Pandora's box. Pandora was the first mortal female endowed with various kinds of gifts by gods and sent to earth to punish the humans. Now one of the gifts was a box that she was forbidden to open. But one day curiosity got the better of her and she opened it unleashing various evil spirits and diseases upon mankind. Therefore, the expression Pandora's box stands for something that is a precursor to several bad happenings. Knowing this background story of Pandora's box, if someone comes across the following sentence, By signing the advertising contract, she has opened up a Pandora's box. He or she will easily understand the allusion. The sentence means that there will be several problems that she would have to face because of the contract. An illusion paints a beautiful picture in the reader's or listener's mind when he or she is aware of the context behind it. 
Some allusions are based on fairy tales and famous works of art. Take for example the following. Her parents had fixed a deadline. She must return home by the Cinderella hour. The allusion is to the fairy tale of Cinderella and her 12 o'clock deadline. Or if you say that she has a mysterious smile like that of Mona Lisa, you are making an allusion, albeit a direct one, to the famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Some sayings from literary works are also quite well known and hence relatable. For instance, take this one. What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. It's an often quoted line from Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. Again, an allusion. Next, we are going to discuss anagrams. What is an anagram? An anagram is a word, phrase or name formed by rearranging the letters of another. Let's take some common words and phrases as examples. Take the word think. The same five letters of the word think can be rearranged into another word, night. Take the word secure. The letters can be rearranged into another word, rescue. Take the phrase the eyes and its letters can be rearranged into the expression they see, which is quite interesting and easy to remember because the second phrase underlines the purpose of the object in the first place. So, an anagram is a type of wordplay in which the letters of a word or phrase are rearranged to create new words and phrases. Now, anagrams are generally made for fun, but sometimes they are used as pseudonyms or quotes. Here are some other interesting anagrams. For the first three, it's fun to see how one phrase defines the other. The first one, slot machines, can be rearranged into the funny phrase, cash lost in me, which is mostly the case when you go to a casino and use a slot machine. Another unique anagram is the phrase, a gentleman, the letters of which can be rearranged into the phrase, elegant man. Did you note the meaning stays the same? A gentleman is, in fact, an elegant man. Similarly, an anagram for a decimal point is, I am a dot in place. Again, an expression that tells you what a decimal point is. And last one, the phrase election results can be rearranged into lies. Let's recount. The smart anagram hints that election results are often lies. As I discussed, anagrams are useful in making pseudonyms or coded messages. And there are many instances in literature where this figure of speech has been used to make an impact. One of my favorite authors, Dan Brown, is a master of anagrams. In his novel, The Da Vinci Code, the museum curator Jack Sonia is murdered. He had written a series of clues in blood before dying. These clues were anagrams related to Da Vinci and Dan Brown uses these to construct a gripping plot. Some of these anagrams were O Draconian Devil for Leonardo Da Vinci O Lame Saint for the Mona Lisa so dark the corn of man for Madonna of the Rocks. Even in other works of literature such as the Harry Potter series, anagrams have been used. The author G.K. Rowling named the two identities of a villain using an anagram. The childhood name Tom Marbolo Riddle can be rearranged to the expression I am Lord Voldemort, which is his alias. Our third figure of speech is oxymoron. This figure of speech is one of the most interesting ones. How do you remember what is an oxymoron? Well, 
The word oxymoron is self-defining. It is a compound word made up of two elements. Oxus meaning sharp and moron meaning stupid. Now sharp and stupid are contradictory, aren't they? So an oxymoron is a figure of speech that juxtaposes elements that appear to be contradictory like sharp and stupid. Let's take some other examples to understand this concept in detail. This glass is fully empty. The phrase fully empty is an oxymoron because the words full and empty are clearly opposites. Is it possible to have living dead among us? The phrase living dead brings to our mind a creature called zombie which is often there in thriller movies. The phrase itself is an oxymoron because the words living and dead are clearly contradictory. So oxymoron is a figure of speech in which we use contradictory words together and you would be right in guessing that the word oxymoron itself is an oxymoron. Now some common oxymorons that definitely deserve a mention. Open secret, as in, her life was an open secret. Clearly confused, as in, he was clearly confused. Found missing, as in, those children were found missing after school. Original copy, as in, she obtained an original copy of that branded purse from the flea market. Act naturally, as in, a seasoned actor acts naturally. Deafening silence, as in, there was a deafening silence in that room. My take on oxymorons is that they are seriously funny. Another very, very important figure of speech in English is euphemism. The word derives from the prefix eu, meaning well, and theme meaning speaking. So euphemism essentially refers to those cases when one tries to use good words while speaking instead of offensive or embarrassing ones. If you look up its meaning in Oxford Dictionary, it goes like a mild or indirect word or expression substituted for one considered to be too harsh or blunt when referring to something unpleasant or embarrassing. A simple example would be saying that his uncle is in a correctional facility instead of saying that he is serving a sentence in a prison or jail. Another example is this female thinking over her termination letter. As you can see, she has a pink slip in her hand. My boss said she was sorry that she had to let me go. I just realized that means I am fired. I have lost my job. In a corporate environment, an employer might tell one of his unwanted employees that we have to let you go, which is a milder term for the expression, we are firing you. Clean your desk and be gone the next morning, which would obviously sound very blunt and insensitive, though both expressions mean that the guy has lost his job. We use such expressions in English language every day. Like for instance, instead of saying that someone has died, we might use the phrase, he passed away. Instead of saying that someone is handicapped or disabled, we might use the term physically challenged or even differently abled to refer to such a person. Similarly, when you inform someone that you have to use the restroom, so you be excused for a few minutes. The expression is a euphemism that you have to go pee in the toilet, which is of course a very blunt thing to say. In daily conversations, when you ask someone as to what his or her current occupation is, you might get the response, oh, I am between jobs nowadays, which is nothing but a euphemism or less embarrassing expression for, I am unemployed. And to make one's profession sound good, one might use and prefer the designation a sanitary engineer instead of being called 
a garbage collector. At last, let's suppose two women are talking to each other, and one of them remarks, "You seem to have gained a few extra pounds lately, or even you look quite full-figured." I think it's a very kind thing to say, but what it actually means is that the other female has become quite fat or even obese. As you would have guessed by now, euphemisms are so popular as these expressions sound polite and help us avoid speaking something that may be very harsh or unpleasant to hear. To summarize, euphemisms make what you speak. We are euphemism is a mild and positive expression used to replace an unpleasant or negative one dysphemism is just the opposite a dysphemism is a derogatory or unpleasant term used instead of a pleasant or neutral one dysphemisms are generally used to shock or offend for instance people often call postal mail by the name of snail mail because it's so very slow like a snail especially if you compare it with the speed of an email similarly there is this term egghead which is used to refer to an intellectual a person who is highly academic or studious the term was originally used to refer to bald persons but not in today's english it's a disparaging term a dysphemism for an intellectual There are many more such dysphemisms in use. Many of them are often called slang words. Some common examples are the word nutcase which is a dysphemism for someone with a mental illness. The word loser which is a dysphemism for a person who hasn't made lots of money or had a professional career. The word loony bin a dysphemism for mental hospital. the word pig a dysphemism for policeman the word bullshit which is a dysphemism for lies and one of the easiest examples of dysphemism to remember are animal names when applied to people in daily lingo we often see people calling others names such as bitch snake coot old bat pig chicken and skunk which are derogatory words this We are halfway through and the next figure of speech we are going to discuss is epithet. To put it simply, an epithet is a descriptive term used to characterize a person or thing that is mentioned. For instance, when I append the phrase the run machine to Virat Kohli, the captain of the Indian cricket team, the term aptly describes his batting skills. It's an epithet. Though sometimes an epithet may even be a disparaging or abusive word or phrase in which case the word epithet is used in a negative meaning and without mentioning any such disparaging words or titles let's see a few instances where the word epithet can be used in such a fashion the group of angry youngsters hurled epithets at each other It means those youngsters called each other bad names. Another one, joining the Me Too campaign, the actress called the famous director a sexual predator, an epithet resonated by many in this field. Back to the positive meaning of epithet. Some easy examples to remember would be that of superheroes and comic characters. in movies comics etc there are descriptive phrases or we can say epithets attached to their names to name a few superman is known by the epithet man of steel batman is known by the epithet the dark knight and there is this family of undercover superheroes known by the epithet the incredibles because they have incredible superpowers Next figure of speech is ellipsis. Literally, the word means to leave out. And the term ellipsis indeed refers to the omission of a word or words. 
It refers to constructions in which words are left out of a sentence, but the sentence can still be understood. According to Oxford Dictionary, the definition for ellipsis is Let's take some examples to illustrate this concept. The first one is You can help with the housework. Your brother can too. As you can note, we drop the words help with the housework inside the brackets and the sentence is still meaningful. Another example I went to the exhibition on Monday and she the next day. Again, I dropped the words inside the brackets, went to the exhibition and the sentence can still be understood. And there is this smart quote from Plato which is a cool example of ellipsis. It goes like this. Wise men talk because they have something to say. Fools because they have to say something. From the examples above, we can infer that ellipsis helps us avoid redundancy. In fact, there is a lot of redundancy in language and it's often surprising to note how much can be left out without losing much meaning, particularly when there are contextual clues as to the real meaning. There is an alternate definition of ellipsis as well, which is important in literature. The word commonly refers to the use of three dots, which can be placed at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of a sentence or clause. These three dots can stand in for whole sections of text that are omitted that do not change the overall meaning. Nowadays, this use of three dots is very popular in social media, as exemplified in the following sentence. This is two girls talking to each other and one of them inquires, he proposed you and dot dot dot. In contrast to ellipsis, our next figure of speech, which is tautology, refers to repetition or redundancy of words or ideas. The word tautology literally means same speak and is defined as the saying of the same thing twice over in different words. Though it is one of the figures of speech, in modern grammar, it is generally considered to be a fault of style. Some easy to understand examples are the sentences. It's a free gift. Now since gifts are always free, we do not need to use the word free to describe the gift. The manager returned back today morning. The word return itself means to come back. So the use of word back with return is superfluous. This project requires some forward planning. Isn't planning always done looking forward? The use of the word forward with planning is totally unnecessary. And last one is, you should carry your basic essentials for the tour. Since the word essential itself means a thing that is absolutely basic and necessary, the use of the word basic with essentials is tautological. Our ninth figure of speech for this lesson is parody. Parody, which is also known as spoof, is imitating someone or something in order to make fun of them. On TV, we often see a stand-up comedian on laughter shows copying the style of a popular actor or politician. That's an example of parody for you. The objective of such a mockery is to make people laugh and to entertain them. According to Oxford Dictionary, parody is an imitation of the style of a particular writer, artist or genre with deliberate exaggeration for comic effect. Now, spoofs are not necessarily made only on renowned people. In Hollywood, there are several movies that fall into this category of parody or spoof on famous movies. One example that I can recall is the film Scary Movie, which is a parody or spoof of the horror genre. And while the only intent behind parody is to entertain people and to make them laugh, our last figure of speech, satire, is slightly different from parody. 
in the sense that the intent behind it is not only to make people laugh but also to make them think about some important issue in satire one tries to convey some important message or make a point oxford dictionary defines satire as the use of humor irony exaggeration or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other topical issues journalists cartoonists etc often use satire to expose the conditions or corruption etc in society through pictorial depictions for instance the cartoon you can see on your screen is a satire on how the poor are even more impoverished due to government policies The well-clothed obese man here is a personification of the government while the poor man feeding him is almost naked and looks so weak and emaciated quite often there is an element of exaggeration in such cartoon strips which use satire Here is another illustration which is a satire on the rampant corruption in society This one shows how government allocates funds for the use of general public but there is leakage at every rung of the ladder so what the poor gets is a negligible portion of the original amount as you can see initially there was a tank from which water was drawn into a big container onto a small bucket then a mug and what gets poured into the general public's mouth is water from a dropper there are many famous comic strips such as dilbert or kevin and hopes which use this figure of speech very effectively while dilbert is a satire on workplace politics and practices kevin and hopes strips contain satire on life and society in general We see issues in many areas such as consumerism, the effect of media on kids, modern family and lifestyles, environmentalism etc getting highlighted in these strips. That brings us to the end of this video. Don't forget to watch part 1 and part 2 of this lesson on figures of speech in which we have already covered 22 of the most common ones also if you like this lesson please click like and subscribe our channel there's a lot of other stuff related to english vocabulary on our channel which i'm sure will keep you interested and thank you for your interest